though its cover is worn and its pages are torn and the places bear traces of tears yet more precious than gold is this book worn and old that can shatter and scatter our fears I trust this book means everything to you it's your resource it's your anchor we come to John chapter 6 in our study of the Gospel of John and title for the next three sermons is Jesus for your every situation in chapter 6 of the Gospel there are three events that occur over two days in the in these two days, every one of you are going to be confronted throughout your life with the same concept that we find here in chapter 6. And we know and we realize from the teaching of Scripture that Jesus is the answer for all three occurrences. In verse 1, John chapter 6, it says, after this. So we just finished chapter 5, and what was concluded there, now it's after this, verse 1. The second event begins at verse 16, which is the evening of this first day, when the evening came. Verse 16, that will be next week's sermon. And then, verse 22, it says, on the next day. So we're given three occurrences, and I believe as you step back and look at these three, verses 1 to 59, these three events, they tie together. They knit together, and Jesus is giving us a big picture that Jesus is the answer for your every situation. I was all set from my study to make this chapter one sermon. And look how many verses there are, and we would have been here most of the day, probably. But the Holy Spirit seemed to say to me, no, people need this, and you need to hone down on each point, rather than rushing through it. So today is part one of a three-part sermon series from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 to 59. If you don't know where to start or how to start reading your Bible, I suggest to you begin reading the Gospels. The Gospel books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us all about Jesus. And we must make much of Jesus, always, at all times. And we must learn about Jesus, about our Christ, our Lord. And there's no better way to learn than to take his life and study his life and his words. So John chapter 6, 1 to 15 is our text. Parallel texts are these three. They're found in all of, this story is found in all of the synoptic gospels. Mark, Matthew 14, Mark chapter 6, and Luke chapter 9. And each of the gospel writers, these four gospel writers, all give a little bit different information concerning this one story. And you may want to read those various viewpoints from, your, from different personalities, and you can do that on your own. That is where you'll find the parallel text. Our text today that we will explain and expound to you is John 6, 1-15. The verses in this text give us a seemingly impossible situation and it's used by Jesus to teach his disciples about faith and about God's provision. And from this sermon, your faith must be in Jesus for every futile, or if you pronounce it futile, you can pronounce it either way, Every futile, seemingly empty, and impossible situation. And I challenge you, seek, pray, wait, and trust in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. That's what we do in the Christian life. We seek His face. We pray. We wait on Him. 
and we trust him for every situation, circumstance of life. So I want you to see number one point today, and then we'll have two and three in coming weeks. Number one, trust Jesus for things that are futile. Let me read the text for you. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we going to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up all the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. An amazing story. Just a tremendous story of Jesus Christ meeting a need. So I want you to see first that we must trust Jesus for things that are futile, for the futile. These 15 verses comprise a story of Jesus feeding 5,000 men. Very likely it's 20,000 to 25,000 men, women, and children. We know they were there even though they're not mentioned. We know they were there because where does Jesus get the basket of food? From a little boy. So there are women and children there. The writers just list it as men. The circumstances are that there's this huge crowd of people. Luke gives us this information in Luke chapter 9 verse 12. Now the day began to wear away. And the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away to go into surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. So Luke gives us the, the idea, although, Matt, although John says there's a lot of grass there, they are not anywhere close to a town, civilization. They're far out. It's a desolate place. The word desolate means wilderness, not near civilization. And he feeds them from a small boy's basket lunch, five barley loaves and two dried fish. And the situation is this. There are a huge crowd of people. There's a need and a concern that they should feed the group. Peter and Andrew, the two disciples that are mentioned by name, in verses 5 and 9, see it as a futile, useless, impossible situation to overcome after they put their mind to try and to reason, out, reason it out. They try to figure it out, and it's an impossible circumstance. The key to the text are the words and thoughts of Jesus in verse 5 and 6. Read verse 5 and 6 together with me in unison. 
Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus asks, Where do we buy the bread? And then we're told he said this to test him. The word test means to prove, to put on trial. A good translation would be to put to the test. Literally, it's to see if something can be done. And what's their conclusion? In man's eyes, no way. It's impossible. There's no possible way. Another word for test could be scrutinize. And Jesus, if we define it that way is saying, Andrew, how are you going to respond? He's scrutinizing, he's putting to test his disciple. And our Lord may do that in your life. When that circumstance or situation comes up that looks impossible, it may be of his doing to say, okay, and put your name in there. What are you going to do about this? How are you going to handle this? One thing I learned from Cindy's operation over 30 years ago is this truth. Trials reveal character Trials never make or form character. When that hard time comes, when that impossible situation confronts you, it's not going to build character into your life. It's going to reveal the character that you have already put into your life and have built into your life. And Jesus is scrutinizing his disciples So what are you going to do? How are you going to handle this? He brought his disciples to an understanding and a visual viewpoint. This is impossible humanly. Things look bleak. It looks futile. Jesus knew the answer. Where are we going to buy bread that these people may eat? And Jesus knew the answer. It's like, wow. Whoa, Jesus, why did you do that? He wanted the disciples to look to him for the answer. That's why he did it. In an impossible situation, he wanted them to look to him for the answer to this problem. The two disciples mentioned don't know what to do. They immediately begin to try to reason that out in their mind. And isn't that what we do in most circumstances of our life? We immediately, our mind starts spinning and to work. Philip mentions a denarii. A denarii was about a day's wage. You work a day, that's what you were paid. And Philip says, that's not near enough. Andrew mentions a small boy's lunch. And Andrew says, that's not near enough. Both of them reasoned out their answer, their solution, and concluded, that's not enough. That's not enough. Now, thank the Lord for moms who have the foresight to pack a lunch and think ahead for their kids. Amen? Thank goodness for mothers. That morning in the kitchen, she had no idea what God would do with those five little loaves and two dried fish. And I think God moved in her mind to pack a lunch for her son. And this woman had no idea she would be an instrument used by the Lord to bless many in the work of Christ. And let me say to you, your menial task, you have no idea 
sometimes how you might bless other people just by doing what you do. By doing what your heart tells you to do. And you're moved to do it. Listen, God tells you down inside, give to that person. You better do it. You better not be stingy about it. God tells you down inside, help that person. He tells you, pray for that person. You better stop and do it. You never know. This woman, packing a lunch for her kid, blesses, encourages, is used of God to speak and be used to twenty to 25,000 people. She had that kind of impact. She was an instrument of the Lord. Have you been lately? Can you be? Yes, you can. When you're selfish or when you're self-centered, you will not be. When you're thinking of others and thinking of Christ and how can I bless or help them, God can use you. But I want you to get the big picture here. The disciples are futile in their reasoning, trying to figure it out. And here they are trying to discuss it. And right there in front of them, Jesus is standing. Right in front of them. And they're trying to figure this out. And yes, Jesus prompted them with the question. Jesus has said, how are we going to buy food for these people? And their mind is running. They're spinning their wheels. And right in front of them is Jesus, the miracle worker. And where did they turn? To their own thinking. The events probably in the second year of his public ministry. So the disciples would have already seen this. Now catch this. They already would have known he turned the water into wine at the wedding at Cana. They already know that story, that miracle. He already has healed every sort of disease, Scripture tells us. He healed the lame man at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath day. They were there. They knew that. He healed the royal official's son. From his sickness, this royal official from Capernaum. We preached all that. We've gone through those stories. They knew this. He changed forever a Samaritan woman. And many in a city were saved. He has already cast out demons. But the disciples are perplexed about how can we feed these people. And Jesus is standing right in front of them. Jesus, the miracle worker. And Jesus is driving this point. Look to me as your source to meet every need. You need to look to Jesus to meet your every need. An impossible situation. It's futile. No way out. And all he wants his disciples to do is Jesus. You've done it before. You can do it again. And he is the answer for your futile, impossible circumstance. Now notice Christ's steps of procedure here. Verse 5, he sees the need. He knows there's a need. That should encourage you. Nothing is going to take him by surprise. He knows everything about you. You're his child. He knows everything you're facing. He knows what's ahead. He knows all about the bends in the road. He knows about your health. He knows about your resources or lack of. He knows and orders the steps 
of a good person. Verse 6b, uh, 6b, Jesus knows what he's going to do. Verse 5, he sees the need. 6b, he knows what he's going to do already. You serve a sovereign Lord. He's in control. You don't have to fret about the economy. You don't have to worry about the leadership. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. He already knows what he's going to do. And he knows how to handle your situation and your circumstance, our nation's, the world's circumstance. He has it all in his hands. Remember the old song, he's got the whole world in his hands? Are you too young to know that song? Third, Jesus tests the faith of his disciples. 6a, verse 6a. He tests them. He puts scrutinize them. How are you going to handle this? How are you going to deal with this? He does the same thing with you. Hey, are you going to look to me? Are you going to pray about this? Or are you just going to complain? Or are you just going to worry? Or are you going to look to Jesus, who is, by the way, right there in front of you. He's with us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He can handle your circumstance. Verse 10, Jesus has the disciples organize the crowd. The other gospel accounts tell us they were organized into 50s and into 100 groups. So it's not just haphazard. He organizes it. It's done in an organized fashion. Verse 11a, Jesus takes what is available. What's available? What was it? Five barley loaves and two fish. Listen, in your life, it's rare when something just drops out of heaven and plops into your lap. Most of the time, he's going to take what's available, what you have already, and he's going to work a miracle that way. He can plop it in your lap. I've seen that happen. It's wonderful. But most of the time, let's just take giving. He's going to take your checkbook or your account, bank account, and you're going to say, I don't know how this is going to happen, how this is going to be met. And somehow, by the end of the month, everything was met. He furthers what you already have. And he extends that. He multiplies it. You give the Lord your money and somehow he just makes it last longer and go farther. Verse 11b, the next step, he gives thanks to God the Father. You need to do that. That needs to be a regular pattern in your life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, O God, for what you provide. Whether it's your car whether it's your tank of gas. In our day, that's bigger than the food, food bill. Whatever it is, give thanks to the Lord for whatever you have. And then verse 11, he sees that God's blessing is distributed. Other accounts tell us the disciples distributed the food out. And I say this to you, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. What is your job and your role? It's distribution. It's not accumulation. The Lord is the Lord of the harvest. He draws them up by his Holy Spirit. Your job and your part is to distribute. And you just keep giving it out. Giving God's blessing in your life out to other people. Whether it's the seeds of the gospel of Jesus Christ, whether it's the word of God itself, whether it's the resources he's provided for you, you keep giving it out 
and he's going to keep bringing it in. But the results are in God's hands. You're not responsible for the harvest. You're not responsible for the results. If you think you are, and there's a lot of preachers in the Northeast who think they are responsible, and we got to spin our wheels, and we got to do this, and we got to do more, and we got to pray harder. No, 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 no. He's Lord of the harvest. We aren't. We just distribute. We just keep giving it out. The results are His. Not yours, not ours, no churches, no preachers. We are to obey by distributing. He says nothing more. He reaps the harvest. If you think you can, you're mistaken. We give, we give, we give, we sow, we sow. God reaps. The harvest. And then verse 12, and I find this interesting. Jesus sees to it that there's no waste. No waste. I may one day give an account for all the things I've wasted. <laughs> and, you know, I thought this through. It's like, whoa. He wanted no waste. We're in the process of packing and moving. You know how many things I've chucked <laughs> and gotten rid of? And it made me wonder, does he think that's waste? <laughs> and we've done a lot to make sure we're not wasting things. But that was important to Jesus because he says, see to it, there is no waste. So we see in these 15 verses, you must trust Jesus for the futile. Things that look impossible. He may just be scrutinizing you. How is she going to handle this? Going to worry? Are you going to trust me? You going to try and figure it out yourself or are you going to pray and seek me? And as we go through this chapter, you're going to see two more things in our own circumstance, how we must trust Jesus for things. Many of you may have known or have heard about the great plague that took place in Europe, in London. It stretched across London like a thick drab blanket. It came as a thief in the night, unannounced. It was silent and the mortality rate was astounding. Someone during the Great Plague in London came up with a foolish idea that people were dying because polluted air was brought on and brought in. So what did people do? Since they thought or heard it was polluted air, they started carrying flower petals around in their pocket. And superstitiously thinking that it, they had the fragrance of flower petals, it would ward off the disease. Groups of victims who were in the hospital would walk outside hand in hand in London and they'd walk in circles around the rose gardens hoping that breathing in the deep aroma of the roses would bring healing for them. Death continued to advance. Another superstitious act was employed with sincerity Many felt if the lungs could be freed from pollution, life then could be, could be sustained. So what did they do? They placed ashes on a spoon and they brought burn ashes up to their nose. And most of them would, yes, sneeze and it would go. But nothing 
retarded the raging death count. Not until the true cause of the great plague in London was found out. And what was discovered was the bite of fleas from diseased rats was the plague that brought the death across London. From that awful experience gave birth to this little song that you have heard of, and I know you probably sang it at one time. Song that innocent children would still, and they still sing it as they play. It was first heard from the lips of a soiled old man pushing a cart in London as he picked up bodies along the alley and put them in his cart to head to the morgue. The song goes like this. Ring around the roses, a pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. That's where that song came from. And we teach that to our little two-year-olds. <laughs> it's like, ugh, when I read this. And let me tell you, things are not always what you think. And you spin your wheels and you try to figure it out. It's futile. You need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And lean and rely and pray and seek Him alone. Nothing else. Put your trust in in the Lord Jesus Christ. Another story I bring to you. In 1874, members of a church down in northeastern North Carolina, Swan Quarter is where it took place, wanted to build a, on a prime property. The owner refused to sell to this church his property. So they erected their church elsewhere, but there was something about that original site that they still prayed about and thought, you know, that would be perfect. September 16th and 17th of 1876, true story. On the eve of the dedication of this new church, a hurricane blew into the area. And Pamlico Sound engulfed Swan Quarter, completely covered it with water. And what it did, it took this new church building off its foundation. And their church brochure says this, and I quote, A miracle was happening. The church was floating down the road. The church moved by the hand of God. It went straight down the road to a corner, bumped into the general store owned by George Credle. The corner is now Oyster Creek Road in U.S. 264 business highway then a curious thing happened they said the building took a sharp right turn headed down the road for about two blocks until it reached the corner of what is now church street it then moved slightly off its straight line course by the water took another turn to the left crossed the carawan canal and directly in front of the place where the people desired the church to be there it settled exactly in the center of Sam Sadler's property, the man who refused to sell them the lot. And today that building remains. And they subsequently, he subsequently sold it to the congregation. And I say all that to say this, where is your faith? If God can send a hurricane to move a church building to a property where he wanted it, he can handle your situation even when it seems futile, impossible. Do you pray? Do you seek him? Do you trust him? Jesus is the answer to all your needs. He's the answer for every situation. He can meet your impossible and make it possible. You must stop looking at the futile and incapable ways to get it done, and you must believe and trust Jesus Christ.
you are his child, he cares for you. How do we apply all this? Number one, do you look at the impossible situation rather the one than the one who can make it possible? You know, feeding the 5,000, the 20,000 people is no bigger of a task, no greater or any more important than the task that's in front of you as you walk with your God. Rather than trusting in your Lord, you attempt to reason out a solution for your problems. You need to be honest. And if so, confess it. Look to Him. Jesus is accessible. He's right before you. You have direct access to Him in prayer and in His Word. And the futile and impossible situations are life thus solved through faith in Jesus Christ. How's your trust factor? You love him. Do you believe him? Can he handle your situation? Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your love. Thank you that you care for us as your children. And Lord, you can handle every circumstance, situation of our life. We should not fret, worry, try to figure it out on our own. Our confidence should completely be in you and in you alone. Take your word, impact us deeply with it, so when that circumstance, situation comes up in the future, we look to Jesus. We wait on you and we trust you. And may we see you do your work. And we'll thank you for it. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.